there's really no end to the fun you can have with a good catapult. And in this tutorial, we'll take a look at how to use Unity's built-in hinge component system to create a catapult that can cause a lot of mayhem in your game. Let's get started. Last video, we looked at how to use Unity's built-in hinge component to create platforms that move when the player steps on them or that could be used as trap doors. In this tutorial, we're going to take it to the next step, finding a way to create springboards and yes, catapults. Getting started, you just need a couple of things. First of all, you're going to need a player who's capable to move around. And next, you're going to need some sort of a platform. And on that platform, you just need to make sure that you have a box collider 2D or some other sort of collider and the hinge joint 2D component. Uh, when you add this, it will also automatically put a rigid body onto that component. Now with those things done, we're ready to get into the code. So let's head down to our assets, go to create, C sharp script, and I'm gonna call mine hinge catapult. In Visual Studio, we'll start by declaring a whole bunch of variables, beginning with some floats. The first will be our trap timer, which is how long it takes for the trap to be activated after something hits it. We'll also add motor speed, which controls the speed of the platform once it's launched. We'll have another one for our motor force, which is how much resistance it will give when the player or another object is on it. Now after this, we're going to make some public references to the components themselves. The first will be to the hinge joint 2D, and we'll call this one hinge so that we can refer to it throughout the script by just the word hinge. And our next one will be the actual motor. So this is a joint motor 2D, and we'll just call it motor. So now that we've told our script that we're going to be talking to a hinge joint and a joint motor, we need to tell them which one specifically it's going to be addressing. So first of all, we'll type in hinge, and then we're just going to get the component of the hinge joint 2D. Now, because this script is actually on the platform, it will automatically look on the platform for that component. And we'll do the same thing for our motor, letting it know simply that all it has to do is look inside the hinge that's already on the platform and just find the motor inside of it. So we can type hinge.motor. With that done, we can pop back up top to make three more variables. Yes, I know it's a lot of variables. The first is a private float called reset trap timer which is how long it will take before the trap can be set off again once it's gone off. We'll create another private float called timer. This is just going to count down the time. And finally, we will make a Boolean value here, which will be called timer start. And this will just start the timer. And now it's time to put these variables to use. So we'll head down into your update function. And we're going to start by creating an if statement. So when timer start gets set off, We'll start counting down time. Now we do that by just typing in timer minus equals time delta time, which will count backwards. And now once that timer reaches zero or less than zero, because that happens quite often, we will now want to set off our trap. Now we're going to begin though by actually turning off our motor. By doing this, we'll be able to set all of the values on the motor all at once and then turn the motor on so that it fires when it's ready. Next, we're going to access our motor itself and specifically the motor speed. And what we want to do here is set the speed of the motor to be equal to the motor speed variable that we created up top. With our motor speed set, we can now set our motor force. Though here we're going to refer to motor.maxmotortorque to do that. And again, we're just going to set it to the value that we've already created in our variable up top. This next line might seem a bit redundant, but it's actually vitally important for our script to work. In the last two lines, we've set values for our motor and stored them. This line here will actually access our hinge motor and apply the motor variables we've just created to it. Now we want this catapult to be able to fling freely. And so we're gonna take a moment here to disable the limits on our hinge so that it's not held back, but can actually go all the way around in a circle. At this point, we're going to be ready to actually turn the motor on. So we'll type hinge use motor true in order to fire this baby up. Now, if we were to run our code right now, unfortunately, nothing would happen. And that's simply because timer start never gets turned on. So what we need to do here is create a new function. We'll make an on collision function. 
Don't forget that you can start typing it and then allow Unity to generate the rest of the syntax for you by just clicking and pressing enter. If we only wanted our catapult to fire when certain objects are on it, we could do that by creating an if statement and then checking to see the if the collision game object has a specific tag like say player. However, for my purposes here, I just want it to fire anything that steps on it. So simply, any time an object collides with my platform, I want timer start to be set to true so that our timer can get going. So back in Unity, I'm just going to click on my platform. I'm going to add a component and we'll add that hinge catapult. And there's a couple of values that we're going to need to put in here. I'm going to keep my timer at one second and I'm going to give those nice giant numbers to my speed and force for now. So let's set my motor speed to, let's go 100,000 and we'll do the same for our um, motor force here. Now I actually want to keep my motor on at the start. I just don't want to set the numbers to anything too crazy just yet. So I'm going to leave them at 125. That will work. I'm just going to move this away from any colliders it might happen to hit. All right, so now it's just sitting there nicely. But when I jump on it, whoa, it launched my player so fast I couldn't even see it happening. Um, I think he's slowly going to re-enter the stratosphere. But no, he's really launched. <laughs> and there he comes. All right, that was um, a little out of control. Uh, we've got a couple of problems here. One, obviously, uh, that might have been a little more force than necessary, but also my trap is not resetting itself at this point. So we're partway there, but not quite yet. Now, if you'd like to get slightly less catastrophic numbers, I, maybe we'll just downgrade this from 100,000 to, let's try 10,000 and see what happens. And we still get a pretty good launch, but that's much more like what I would like to see. However, the problem remains that the trap is not resetting itself and it's doing this weird thing here. Oh, look at that every time I collide now. Uh, but it's, yeah, it, <laughs> it is out of control. All right, so let's head back into our script. Now to get this working the way we intend, we're going to need to reset our trap and all of its values. But for that to work properly, we're going to have to be able to create a pause in our execution of the code. And to do that, we're gonna need something called a coroutine. Now, if you haven't worked with these before, you can create a coroutine, which is just a type of function by typing in I enumerator. You then, as you would with any other function, you can pick a name for it. I'm going to call mine reset trap, then put your brackets and curly brackets. And inside, we can start coding our function. Now, at first, Visual Studio is not going to like that at all. And one of the reasons is because we have to actually call this function. Now we can do that up here in our start timer so that after the trap goes off, we will type start coroutine. And then in brackets, we just type the name of the coroutine. Now that still hasn't fully resolved things and that's because coroutines need to return a value. So we're going to do that here. We're gonna type yield, which will pause the execution of this function. And then we'll type our return statement, which just tells it to wait for a certain amount of time. Now you could hard code this value by putting something like 0.5 but I prefer not to do that as often as possible. That's why up top here we created the reset trap timer, which is set to 0.1 seconds at the moment, and so we can just type that variable in here. That way we can always change it from within Unity if we want to make it longer or shorter. Now the very first thing we want to do in this coroutine is actually turn off our timer. So we're going to take that timer start boolean and set it to false so that it's not still counting down. Now we'll wait until the reset trap timer is over, then we can actually just copy all of the information that we use to arm our trap in order to disarm it. So one thing we don't need here is that we're not gonna need to turn off the motor. It can now stay running. However, we are gonna wanna set our motor speed not to the value we've set in Unity, but just back to a default value. So in my case, 100 degrees per second. My motor force, in my case, I believe I was using 20. I'm also going to want to take my hinge motor dot motor. And again, um, this line is necessary to make everything work properly. And so once you've reset your values by typing in hinge motor dot motor, it will now apply those to the actual motor itself. Um, we're also going to want to turn the limits back on. And again, actually, we'll just move this up because this line here is the one that actually applies those values. We want to set everything and then apply them. We don't need to turn the motor back on here. It's already on, so we can just leave that there. And finally, the last thing we're gonna wanna do is just reset our timer to whatever the trap time was. 
All right, so at this point, we're gonna have something that mostly works. If I uh, set my numbers on the hinge to something reasonable like 100, I'll be able to step on it and it'll get a little bit of force at the end. If I, let's up that a little bit to maybe say 1000, I can walk over on it, but we're already noticing some problems. So right now my hinge has come unhinged. There we go, back to normal. So with them set to 1000, things will mostly work. I can step on it and after a second, it will catapult me. As you saw, we'll sometimes run into a problem where the hinge comes unhinged, but also if we make these numbers significantly large, and we're gonna want that if we really wanna launch things, you'll notice that once my player gets shot, sometimes the platform just goes all crazy. Now, one easy way to help combat a lot of this is just by making sure that we have a connected rigid body applied. So in my case, my ground has a composite collider on it, which has its own rigid body attached. And so if I wanted to, I could simply click on the platform and drag my entire ground into that so that it's now connected to that rigid body. Doing that will go a long way to solve our problems as it's our platform is now actually hinged on to another rigid body. You can see that's working pretty nicely. I can also take those numbers up to something a little bit more crazy, like 10,000. And when I jump on it, it will give me a really nice launch and then it resets itself. We will still occasionally get some funny things with our platform occasionally colliding oddly with other layers. And so this is where another thing that we can do and one final little tweak we're going to make is I want to make it so that this platform doesn't actually detect when it hits the other ground items. And in order to do that, first of all, what I'm going to do is just click on the platform itself. And rather than have it be part of the ground layer, I've created a new layer called trap door that I'm going to use. Um, if you don't haven't done that already and you're not sure how, just click add layer and you can create new layers there. I'm gonna make mine into a trap door. Now, if I head into my project settings, so edit, project settings. Now inside of here, under physics 2D, make sure you're in the 2D section. If you scroll down, you'll notice that we have trap door here. And what I'm actually doing is making it so my trap door only interacts with my player level and my interactables, which for me is things like boulders and stuff like that. That way, when it touches the ground, it's not going to be firing randomly and that sort of thing. One other bonus of this is that now I don't need to keep a little gap between my platform and the ground so that they aren't touching. I can actually have my platform overlap with the ground if I like. All right, with that done, I'm now free to walk over on the platform, which will fire me. It's now staying properly hinged. It's not colliding with the ground and it's working quite nicely. And if I want, I can add a little bit more force to make things really interesting. All right, there you have it. Those are catapults and they'll actually work really nicely with some other elements. Oops. So now I can also do things like grab this boulder here, which is part of my interactable layer, push it over, and I can use that to launch boulders as well, which is just plain fun. All right, I hope you found this tutorial helpful. If you have, I encourage you to click like or subscribe to the channel. This is Matt with Night Run Studio. Thanks for watching.